filled with death, war, and evil. How are we to face what feels like an unknowable future? What do we do with our anxiety regarding the days ahead? Where's the church? Where do we find hope and strength for, for our hearts in these days? We find hope in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. In this episode, Pastor Borman and Pastor Krieger talk about the sure and certain hope that we have at the coming of Jesus on the last day. Our destiny and the eternity of those who die in the faith is secure and eternal through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Today, we're looking at 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. For more audio or video content, check out our website, themountmke.com. Do you want to check them off? Yeah, let me. So, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in First Thessalonians four. Oh, no, our Bibles um, are on And <laughs> First Thessalonians. Maybe if you could just take a take a minute and mute yourselves. And if you have a question, just um, unmute yourself and ask. We'll pause during this. Um, our our kind of our intent as we've been doing this is just to talk through a section of scripture. Um, let you think about it, and then toward the end, um, you can a- maybe ask some questions, or even in the middle if you have something you want to say. Um, I did share before I logged out of the other section. I did share kind of a just some ta- some how how we're planning to walk through it today. Um, and if you're looking at the top, one of the things that I've been I've noticed about Thessalonians is Paul is teaching the Thessalonians how to be a community. Um, what it means, and what I mean by that is he's talking to them about what, what it means for them to be called out of the world. If you if you look back and think back to chapter one, um, where he's talking to them about how they turn, he, there's a report he gives in verse nine. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. So these Thessalonians, they're they're learning, and you know we've talked about a number of times throughout the study that we're not sure how long Paul had with them, but maybe it wasn't as long as you might imagine. A couple of weeks, um, at the at a minimum, three weeks, maybe longer. Um, people aren't totally sure on that. Uh, the Book of Acts only talks about three weeks, but he's teaching them about what it means. And so, I, a word that maybe to, to get us into the context of Thessalonians again is is that the that his followers of Jesus were different. So. Just getting back to chapter four last week, we talked about how the Thessalonians are different because of their sanctity, um, their their holiness. They're set apart for God, and, and specifically, Paul talked about the, a sexual life, um, a pure, a sexually pure life, um, because they're set apart from the world. If again, notice how you, how in that section how Paul says you're different. You're you're not. You shouldn't be like the pagans. So he's, he's making a clear distinction between who they are. In the section we looked at Sunday where we talked about being productive, focused, and quiet, again, it's, it's a life that, that we're, we're, we're doing our own thing as we follow Jesus and we're doing the things God has called us to do. And at the same time, I barely touched on this, but notice how it's different at the, end, at the beginning of verse 12, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. So Paul keeps coming back to this. You You have been called out of darkness into light. That's what Peter says. Um, You're different now. And Pastor Krieger, as we get into the text for today, um, can you talk about what that, just kind of give us a, take us on a hot air balloon ride over the next couple of sections, how Paul shows us that, that we're different um, and what that, and, and then take us into the beginning of the text today. Sure. So as we see today, we're kind of turning a corner, um, where Paul is going to say, and, and now we want to talk to you about what's ahead. Um, so as we you know, continue on in this theme of different, as Christians, we're different because of the future um, and because of our knowledge of the future, because of what we know is, is going to happen to us in the future. We know what lies ahead for us in the life to come. And so we don't have to be worried um, like the rest of the world is worried. And we don't have to grieve like the rest of the world. We can look forward beyond that to the life that we have with Jesus. Uh, That's really especially the part that we're going to be taking a look at today. And then um, 
in the next couple of sessions as we get together or, or um, Pastor's sermon on Sunday, we start getting into chapter five. Um, then he's looking specifically at the day of the Lord. And we're going to see a little bit about the day of the Lord today too, but we're different as Christians because we have this understanding of the day of the Lord, uh, because we know that our Savior is coming back. Uh, there are significant portions of our church here that we dedicate to that, the season of Advent, the season of end times, that Jesus says, you know, always be ready, um, be on guard, watch out. Uh, so you aren't led astray. Be prepared because at any moment he's coming back. Uh, and so that also makes us different. Uh, you want me to dig in then right away, Pastor, into verse 13? Yeah, why don't you, why don't you, why don't we read the section? And then if you want to get, take us into immediately how Paul kind of teaches us about looking, looking ahead. All right, sounds good. Um, verses 13 through 18 then of First Thessalonians 4. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Uh, welcome, John. I see you just joined us. Just to let you know, we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tonight. We're going to be starting at verse 13 here. So that first verse, brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. I mentioned to Pastor Borman as we were going through this, if I were writing a sermon on this, I think my sermon theme would be, don't be ignorant. Um, it's just a nice, you know, it gets your attention. We don't want you to be ignorant. And we think, well, we don't want to be ignorant people. Uh, but why is he saying that? I think when we're ignorant of what's going on in this world, we have a pretty common expression that says ignorance is bliss. Um, it, it sometimes is nice not to know everything that's going on around us. And, and, and maybe you've gotten a bit of a sense of that lately. The more you scroll through the newsfeed right now, does that translate to the better you feel? Uh, because I don't know, it certainly doesn't have that effect on me. The, the more I become informed of what's going on in the world, the, the more anxiety I start to feel. And I think that's always true in life in this world, that the, the more we know about this sinful world that we live in, the harder it gets. But with Jesus, it's the opposite. When we're ignorant of Jesus and his love for us, that's what causes angst and anxiety and depression when we're ignorant of the joys that await us through jesus that's when death is scary or even terrifying paul says we don't want you to be ignorant uh, about jesus about what we have through him uh, because you know about death you know that people die what we want you to be informed about is what happens to those who die in christ and so that's really the theme then of what we're going to see uh, in this little section from verses 13 through 18. That's the introduction he gives as he leads us then into that message about Jesus in starting in verse 14. So Pastor Borman, do you want to take it from there? Yeah, and I think one thing just to, to carry on that theme of different, if you look at the end of verse 13, 
he says he wants you want to he wants them he wants you to understand and know about these things so that you don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope that there's one thing that makes the christian at a funeral different from the non-christian at a funeral um the way that we grieve and we talked a little bit about that before the way and maybe the easiest example to think about what is it what does christian grief look like i maybe it's easiest to look at a kid um they they kind of have the they have this understanding that man it stinks that the person i loved has died but it's okay i'll see him again um they're the ones at the funerals who are teaching the adult um and they they have this they're crying and they're sad and they're going to miss whoever it is that's died at, and yet at the same time they they grieve with this great great hope because they just kind of matter of factly be like yep all right i know this and it and just to carry that into verse 14 it comes out of this confession that jesus died and rose again and so we believe that god will bring with jesus those who have fallen asleep in him paul keeps coming back to this as I think you you start to realize when you walk through this how interconnected, um, and maybe that's the wrong word, but how connected the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Jesus is to everything that we believe. Um, if you, it, this is First Corinthians a little bit, but if you take the resurrection of Jesus away from anything in Scripture, all of a sudden everything else falls apart. And Paul, you see this in verse fifteen. And then again in verse 16, Paul is drawing conclusions for us. Why don't we grieve like people who have no hope? Because this is what we believe. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And as a result, right, there's notice the connections. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who believe in him. This is that verse 15, I I think in a way is kind of a, this is a statement of what Paul's, it's, it's why we don't grieve like people who have no hope. But it's also the content of what he's going to explain later, later on, because in, in the following verses, um, he's going to lay out, here's how it's going to happen. But the brunt of it, the thrust of what he's going to say is right there at the end. Because of Jesus, we believe that God's going to bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Anything else that you would add there, Pastor Krieger? Oh, I... I think that about covers it. Just going back to the first part of 14 there, the Apostle Paul does not teach us anything without tying it into the death and resurrection of Jesus, does he? Um, He he was a master at at weaving together, you know, what would be an excellent sermon for us just in these letters that he's sending to these churches. Um, But he says, we want to talk about those who have died we have to talk about Jesus who died and rose again. Um, that's what it's all going to go back to. And that's what we have to, to keep in mind. Then as we go towards verse 15, he starts telling us a little bit more about what's going to happen on the last day uh, when Jesus comes back. And he even lays out for us a bit of the schedule, um, the order in which things are going to happen. And he starts off by saying, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that this is what's going to happen. Now, you can go back through Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and try and find this, and you're going to have some trouble. Um, So what is the Lord's word that that Paul is referring to here? It's got to be either something that Jesus shared with the rest of the disciples before he left that they have now shared with Paul, either that or something that Jesus shared with Paul directly. Um, We know from elsewhere in his writings that he had revelations of of Jesus, um, just like John had a revelation of Jesus. And so Paul is able to fill in for us now some of the details of what the last day is going to look at. He says, we who are still alive until the coming of the Lord, and I think we'll get to that in a minute here too, how how Paul seems to think this is happening during his lifetime. Um, We will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Um, We are not going to get into heaven and they lose out because they've died. 
before Jesus came back. It seems to be a, a fear that the Thessalonian congregation had. Um, they had heard that Jesus was going to return to take us all to be with him in heaven. But now that Paul's left, some of their friends, their family members have died. And so what's their fate? They wanted to know what happens to them. They died and Jesus hasn't come back yet. Uh, and so Paul starts to give them this same kind of hope that we would hear at any funeral, any Christian funeral service, uh, that those who die in the Lord don't just disappear. Uh, but he uses this word here, those who have fallen asleep, uh, that they have simply fallen asleep. Their soul is with Christ and their body will be awakened by him when he returns. I can't get too far into it or I'll steal more thunder from you, Pastor Borman. You're doing great. Um, yeah, I think, I just think it's amazing when you look through this section how, and this will come up again, but I think it's just amazing how um, Paul has this expectation that he's still going to be alive when this happens. And maybe that's, a, that's kind of a foreshadowing question as we look at this in the next section is, how, I mean, how often is the return of Jesus on your mind? How often are you expecting that Jesus is going to come during your lifetime? Is that something that you have even thought about? Um, I, I mean, I, we were talking about this before, Pastor Kruger. I don't know that, that this is – I think about it a little bit these days, maybe more often during these coronavirus days than I normally do. Um, but it's not a normal thought where I'm like, you know, I wake up in the morning like, huh, I wonder if Jesus will come today. I think that this was something on his mind and looking at the next verse, it's, he makes it really clear. This is not something that you're going to miss. Like just try to imagine this, the, as, as Paul describes what's going to happen when Jesus comes, you've got the Lord himself coming down from heaven, which is something that we can't even imagine all on its own. And then you've got an archangel crying out. And then you've got a trumpet call of God. And then you've got the dead in Christ coming up from the grave. Like I, if this happens, when, not if, when, when this happens, this is not going to be something that you'll miss. Just imagine the sky being torn apart at Jesus' baptism. Everybody who was there couldn't miss it, although not everybody understood the words that were said. But, but this, is not, this is not something that Paul talks about this in Philippians, right? Where every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess. This is not a moment that the world is going to miss. And, and going back to that fear, we aren't totally sure what the fear is, but if they were afraid that, the people who died in faith are going to miss out. Paul is making it absolutely clear. No, they're not going to miss out. They're going to rise first. So they're, they, they're going, and commentators have a little bit of conversation about that word first, but it seems to be, this is an order. Um, they're, they're going to rise. This is one of the first things that's going to happen. They're going to rise first and then, okay, I'm done. Then Paul says, here's what's going to happen next. Pastor Trigger, anything that you would add there or just take us into the next verse? Sure. I think um, just one interesting point, um, when he talks about the trumpet call of God, Paul talks about that, that same trumpet call in Corinthians chapter 15. He says, um, at the last trumpet in a flash and a twinkling of an eye, Jesus will return and and we will all be changed. And there he calls it the last trumpet. I think we can see some parallels there with John's revelation of the last day that he talks about the seven trumpets too. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's just mind boggling to me to think of, you know, the Lord revealing these things to these men, but what a blessing because now they're able to share with us um, a little bit more information about what this is going to be so that so that it really can be um, as Jesus said when that day comes something that we can just lift up our heads and say ah yeah it's finally here and not something that we have to be dreading or, or worrying about as it comes we don't have to be afraid 
because he says, uh, going into 17 now, that after that, after Jesus appears and the dead in Christ rise, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. There's a lot in that passage. Um, it's just, I don't know, the more I read it, it's just a fun verse to read. Like, this is what it's all about, right, guys? I mean, those of us who are still alive will be caught up together with those who have gone on before us, the people that you're missing right now, um, that you haven't seen in a while. There they are, together with Jesus. We're caught up together with them to meet the Lord. And so we will be with him forever. Um, the word, the verb there, caught up together with them, that Greek word is where the word rapture comes from. Um, so you can tell people, yeah, I, we believe in the rapture. Um, just not maybe necessarily like you do. Uh, we believe that on the last day, we will be raptured, caught up together with Jesus in the air. Um, everyone, all of us who believe in him. And then that last part of the verse, and so we will be with the Lord forever, um, reminds me since we had our Good Shepherd Sunday this week of the last passage from Psalm 23, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And, and David even breaks that um, in the Psalms, you know, you usually have the first line of the verse, and then we have an indent in the second line. Uh, the first line is, and so I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And the second line of that verse, the last verse of that psalm, is simply the one word, forever, um, at all times. Not just, you know, when I tell Heather, I'm going to be with you forever, you know, but I won't be because there's going to be times when I go to work or when she goes to work and and we're not together anymore. But this is God saying, I will be with you at all times. Uh, never again will there be a moment when we are not in each other's presence. Because we will be with him forever. Back to you, Pastor Borman. Yeah, and that, that was really interesting to look at that with you today. That word uh, forever is not the normal Greek word. I know this is a little dorky, but... Um, it's not the normal Greek word that you'd for, get forever, but I think what you said is, is right on that Paul's emphasizing that every moment of, e of eternity, he will be with us. And I think that's a really, really neat thing that, you know, you, if you think back to the things that maybe they're afraid about, you, they're afraid of what's going to happen to my fellow believer who died. Um, are they going to miss out? And Paul is emphasizing two really important things throughout is one, they're not going to miss out. They're going to rise up and you will be together with them so that we will, there is this joyful reuniting that we will have this uh, joyful uh, reunion of God's people in heaven. And even greater than that, uh, this greater reunion with our savior. Now it's now we live by sight, faith, then we'll live by sight. Um, see him as Job says, face to face. Um, and what a really, really cool thing. And I think that's, and Paul's saying, as you wrap this up, therefore, encourage one another with these words. He intends that we would not only grieve like people who have hope, because we do have hope, but also that we would take this truth that we have and say to those who do grieve in Christ that there's, here's hope, right? Here, here's, here's the truth from God that's based on solid truth that you can, you can base your hope on that you can live your life on. I, 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 I forgot to look it up after we talked today, but there's that peanuts cartoon and maybe somebody can Google it and look it up. Um, but they're, they're debating some sort of, uh, feel they're, they're troubled or pastor Kruger's looking up now. Perfect. Um, they're, they're, they're debating this, um, they're troubled by something. And one of the characters, I can't even remember the character says, Jesus died and rose again, or he states a theological truth. And the one person responds, now I feel better. And, and the response is, well, that's what truth 
And that's what doctrine does. Doctrine makes me feel better. Um, I think sometimes we, we're tempted to shy away from doctrine, from teaching um, specific things. Her, here it comes. Why don't you read it to us, Pastor Krieger? Uh, am I, I'm not muted, am I? No. All right. Uh, so you can see it there. Lucy is talking to Linus. Boy, look at it rain. What if it floods the whole world? Linus says, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is the rainbow. And Lucy says, you've taken a great load off of my mind. And Linus answers, sound theology has a way of doing that. Good one. And, I, well, that's, and that's just it. That's what Paul is doing. He's doing, he's doing sound theology. He's, he's giving us the truth from God. Um, what Paul says in, Thess in this section of First Thessalonians is not surprising or new. Um, it's stuff that Jesus taught. Um, it's he, he, he Jesus spends entire an entire cha entire chapters of Matthew teaching about the end times, his return, teaching us to be ready, um, teaching us about Judgment Day. Uh, because and it's sound theology has a way of preparing us for Judgment Day. Has a way. Of and we wait for Judgment Day. Um, so there's a couple of takeaways. We'll pause in a moment for some questions, but maybe just a couple of takeaways. Um, Pastor Krieg, you want to take that, just walk us through that first one? Yeah, so if you have the sheet in front of you, number one says, the future of the believer is guaranteed presence with the Lord forever. Um, Heather and I have been trying to figure out, are we doing any camping or any sort of vacation this summer? And it's hard to plan something like that right now, isn't it? Um, who knows if parks will be open? Who know, Yeah, what's allowed? We, you know, the future right now seems uncertain, um, but only our immediate future. Our extended future is by no means uncertain. Uh, it's guaranteed and we know what it is. And so when the immediate future is maybe a little uncertain, we can take great comfort in that. And so just something to hold on to, uh, especially right now when we don't know what next week or next month will bring. We know that once Christ returns, we know exactly what our fate is. You wanna take number two, Pastor Borman? I don't know if Pastor Borman is still with us. He's either holding very still or he's frozen. <laughs> frozen. <laughs> Number two, at least he looks deep in thought in my screen. Yeah. <laughs> Number two says, death is not an end, but a transition. Oh, are you with us again now, Pastor? Carry we'll on. All right. Number two, death is not an end, but a transition. There's a quote there from Martin Luther King Jr., the the civil rights guy, not the 1500s guy. I hope you find some consolation from Christianity's affirmation that death is not the end. Death is not the period of the great sentence of life, but a comma that punctuates it to a more lofty significance. Death is not a blind alley that leads the human race into a state of nothingness, but an open door which leads man into eternal life. Let this daring faith, this great invincible surmise, be your sustaining power through these trying days. I don't know if you know anybody uh, right now who is on the verge of dying, uh, but that's a really neat thought right there, that death is not a period, it's a comma. Um, C.S. Lewis had a similar quote where I think it was in one of the Narnia books, The Last Battle, his final book there. And, and as they go into Aslan's kingdom, uh, he mentions how, how they discovered that in the story of their lives, everything that had happened to them throughout their entire life in this world was simply the cover page. Uh, it was just the introduction to the story of of what was coming. 
Uh, so it's a comma, sure, but the re second half of that sentence is, is going to be really long. Um, I got a message that maybe not all of you have these notes in front of you. I will make sure that we get them sent out. We usually, I think Pastor has been um, attaching them to the, to the notes. So I'm going to get through the last two and then I'll add it to the message chat um, before we leave. So you can copy and paste it before we close the meeting. Thank you, Katrina. Number three, what we know of the future shapes how we live in the present. I think we've seen a lot of evidence of that with our discussion today that, um, that just knowing what's coming, knowing that Christ comes again, knowing that we live forever impacts us every day, how we live our lives, how we handle the things that come at us. Uh, and then finally, number four, this takeaway comes not from myself or Pastor Borman. It's verse 18 from chapter four. Now that you know this, now that we're no longer ignorant of these things, encourage each other with this news. Um, you know what lies in store for Christians when they die, uh, that it is only sleep, that we will wake again. Our bodies will be awakened by Jesus when he comes, that the moment we die, our soul goes to be with him. Um, this isn't something that he leaves us in the dark about. He tells us so that we can be encouraged and so that we can encourage. Um, so Paul wants us to do that. We're going to find a very similar passage at the end of chapter 5 where he talks about the judgment on the last day. And he ends by saying, now you know. Judgment isn't something you have to be scared about. Encourage each other with this. It's going to be okay. Uh, the, the last chapter of this part of our lives is it's all good news. Um, if you want to look ahead, the passage that pastor is going to be preaching on on Sunday is First Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. Uh, his main question to ponder as we get ready for that is how often is the return of Jesus on your mind? How often is it a part of your conversations? Uh, so things to think about as we um, as we come into the next week here. Let's go ahead then, Pastor Borman, it looks like you're back. You wanna close us out with a prayer? Sure, uh, before we do, does anybody, I don't wanna keep you longer than you wanna yeah. be here, but does anybody have any questions or things that you wanna to add to the conversation tonight? I have a question. Um, I volunteered to uh, deliver. Uh, we know. Oh, we do. Yeah. Never mind. Mary <laughs> 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 told me, and I saw it. Uh, he's talking about tomorrow. The time. <laughs> <laughs> One flash right there. One flash. <laughs> you know. Any, any other questions? I just want to make a comment yeah. that um, when my dad passed away, this portion of scripture was read at his funeral, and it's always been a favorite and most comforting part of scripture for me um, to have that hope of eternal life and how wonderful it's going to be. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus and makes you feel not so sad. Mm-hmm. When I was a young pastor, the very first funeral I did, the undertaker told me, I could tell right away when the family came into uh, my establishment that they were Christians, because Christians always grieve differently from the rest. Did he quantify that at all? Uh, he's, he's, How did it look different to him? The, the peace, he mentioned the peace, you know, that, and he was talking about a family where the father died suddenly, so it was a bit of a shock to everybody, but, uh, but the family came in and they, they had a strong conviction about eternal life, and he said some, you know, some of his customers just, they have, they're, they're just torn up and there's no peace there. Christians grieve differently, that's for sure.
Well, why don't we close with prayer? Thanks for your patience and for being with us tonight. Let's, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we pray that, that your word would set roots down in our hearts and that in our hour of trial and trouble, uh, when we stare death in the face, when we grieve uh, the loss of loved ones um, who died in the faith, uh, we pray that these words from Paul would come to our mind, that we would remember the great, great hope that is ours, that one day we will be together, we will meet the Lord in the air, and we will be with you forever. Jesus, we cannot wait for that day. Um, in our days of trial, rem remind us of these words. Uh, when others around us are struggling with death and grief and their own sorrow, Help us to point them to the clear teaching of your word, good theology, good teaching from your word, so that in their hour of trial, trial, we might be someone who steps to their side and gives them encouragement from you. Um, let, us, let us take these words uh, that mean so much to us and to our own hearts. Let us take these words to them. And so tonight, Lord, let us lay our heads down on our pillows and rest deeply and rest well, uh, because our eternity is secured. Um, by you, and it's secure for us. Uh, we thank you for this and ask you to give us rest tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.